Hello and a very warm welcome to ZC3 Thought Leaders. My name is Finley Johnson, Sector Director at Mobility Ways, and I'll be chairing today's session. I'd first like to thank everyone who's registered for today's event. Uh, I'd also like to thank our speakers who kindly agreed to give up their time to contribute to the event. A few administrative points. So a recorded version of this webinar will be available following the event. Uh, we'll email a link of the recording to all registrants and uh, you can also access it via the Mobility Ways YouTube channel. Um, we'd love to hear from you today. So there is a Q&A icon in the taskbar at the bottom of your screen. So if you've got any questions for any of our speakers, please add those in the Q&A box and we'll endeavour to get through as many as possible. So back to the event. And for those of you who've just been joining in the last few minutes, welcome once again to ZC3 Thought Leaders. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with ZC3, it stands for Zero Carbon Commuting Conference, and today's session is called Tackling Commuter Emissions at Higher Education Institutions. Um, as a brief introduction, of course, this is an important issue. 24% of higher education sectors total emissions relate to scope three travel and transport. That, of course, includes employee and student commuting. Uh, universities have a duty to report and reduce commuter emissions, of course, to help tackle the climate emergency uh, and to comply with the Department for Education's sustainability and climate change strategy. Uh, commuter emissions aren't easy to measure. Uh, the lack of consistency in report methodology makes it difficult for universities to make reduction plans and to benchmark themselves uh, with other institutions. What's more, reducing non-essential travel, shifting mindsets towards sustainable commuting alternatives throws up a number of challenges, not least how to engage students and the staff in travel planning and to encourage behavior change. So today's session agenda aims to address some of this and to shed light on some of the most recent developments around commuting at higher education institutions. How institutions can measure emissions, bring consistency to the sector. We'll also be showcasing some of those who are leading the way in areas of collaboration, stakeholder engagement, and behavior change. And then in our behavior change session, we'll be hearing some of the latest psychological research that institutions may want to consider when drawing up uh, travel plans. And in our concluding panel discussion, we aim to tackle some of the key questions surrounding behavior change uh, with staff and student commuters. So we've got a great lineup for you today. It's now time for our first speaker. I'm delighted to introduce Fiona Goodwin, Deputy CEO at EAUC. So Fiona, enough of me, over to you. Thank you very much, Finlay, and hello and welcome, everybody. Um, next slide, please. So the EAUC is the Alliance for Sustainability Leadership in Education, and we exist to lead and empower the post-16 education sector to make sustainability just good business. Next slide, please. So back in January this year, we um, launched the standardized carbon emissions framework, which was part of the Accelerating Towards Net Zero report, um, which was part of the Queen's Anniversary Prizes, which was developed by the Queen's Anniversary Prize winners, which was 23 institutions from across uh, the UK, both higher and further education. Um, we had a ministerial response to the recommendations, and we also received Secretary of State Education support as well. Next slide, please. Uh, I won't go through all of that, but that is the Secretary of State's um, uh, recommendations and support for the report. Next slide, please. So just to put some context in terms of this, um, 
the government has a net zero target of 2050. Depending where you are in the UK, you might have different uh, targets in there. So Scotland's 2045, for example. Um, there's increasing student expectations for institutions to really take uh, these challenges on board and to be really open and transparent about being net zero. The Department for Education launched their sustainability and climate change strategy last year. Um, so that's got to be a big driver across all education settings. And then we also have the Green Jobs Task Force and increasing public sector reporting, which obviously is already mandatory in Scotland, um, but is going to be coming soon for England as well. And obviously the net zero plans, they do need financing. Um, so that's a really critical part in terms of making sure we have that information. Next slide, please. So in terms of sort of more context about this is, you know, that there's various studies out there in terms of this. Um, but, you know, for example, 75% of young people say they're frightened about that future. That is just really troubling, isn't it? And the FE in, uh, sector educates 1.6 million students a year, which is over 2% of the English population. So there's a really critical audience that we have in order to influence. Next slide, please. And here we've got from um, the Accelerating Towards Net Zero report was the measurement of the sector's carbon footprint. So that's 18, over 18 um, million tonnes of CO2, which is contributed by HE by 86 and FE 12%. So there's a huge amount of responsibility um, that education institutions have for this. And 91% of students agree that their place of study should really actively incorporate and promote sustainable development. And 74% of international institutions say how seriously um, the university takes action on global development and environmental issues is likely to influence their choice of institution. So if you're wanting to really attract more international students as well as UK students, you really do have to act in this area. Next slide, please. So obviously when we're talking about carbon uh, reporting, there's various risks and barriers. Obviously, mitigation um, is a crucial thing. Buildings have to be adapted for the changing climate, for more, more increased uh, heat temperatures, um, but flooding as well as that. Um, I've already mentioned about funding. There is a lack of funding, but there are opportunities there as well. And there's also a lack of senior management understanding and support. Um, we've got a crucial sort of role within that in terms of really having leadership programs and training programs for senior management. And a perception of lack of student and staff engagement, and also the lack of technical knowledge within these institutions as well. And obviously, there's huge competing demands that institutions face. Next slide, please. Obviously, there are opportunities here as well. So improved efficiency, that saves costs, especially in the energy crisis that we're in. Um, there's huge amount of savings that can be made here. As I've always mentioned, uh, keeping relevant with students and keeping the green skills agenda on there. It's also community engagement, business engagement, and there's local support networks through other education settings, so other schools, colleges, and other universities within your place. And there are opportunities for funding available. And there's a real um, urge with the sector to share best practice and also share, share leadership that your institution is taking steps by joining the Race to Zero and signing up to the SDG Accord. Next slide, please. So why have we developed a carbon reporting framework? The essential item is that we need a really consistent approach. So before this, universities and colleges were using different approaches, including and excluding different bits. So you really couldn't do that comparable benchmarking against other institutions. Also, it's really important to have clear transparency, both for staff and students and your wider stakeholders. It was also a requirement in the Department of Education, Sustainability and Climate Change Strategy. And it provides crucial guidance to the sector. 
and it was really developed using the expertise from the sector for the sector. Next slide, please. So what is it? So we haven't invented anything new here. This is the greenhouse gas protocol. This ensures that it is consistent with other sectors and other organizations reporting. We provide methodology guidance, and we also have a plain English interpretation. Of what does that actually mean? So you don't have to be a carbon reporting expert to understand this, but the crucial element is that we've put a lens on this for the education sector. So actually, how do you apply the greenhouse gas? greenhouse gas protocol um, to a university or a college setting. So it's really looking at what does that actually mean for an institution. And we have three different levels of reporting, um, depending on where you are with your data um, accuracy. So you have beginning levels and advanced levels, and it's for the institution to choose across all the different areas for which level they're happy to to be at and you might start at the beginning but have a plan to move further on on the advanced or you might be happy that actually even on the, on the beginning stage it's fine for certain areas next slide please so we're just going to have a quick look at in terms of what are carbon emissions so you have scope one scope two and scope three and i'll just go through those quickly uh, next slide please so with scope one this is the direct greenhouse gas emissions, so natural gas, fuel, refrigerants, diesel, light land and livestock. Next slide, please. Scope two is the indirect emissions from purchased electricity, heat and steam. Next slide, please. And scope three, this is the one that's relevant to this particular event. So this is where we have the business travel, the staff commuting, working from home, and the UK student travel and international student travel. And I'll just go through those in a little bit more detail next slide please. So business travel, so this is emissions associated with transportation of employees and related activities such as hotels. So this is mileage, train travel, taxi, car hire, etc. Um, collect travel, spending data and then you can apply that emission factor to then get more higher quality accurate data. You can then use the actual mileage and the distance data, as well as what type of transport and what class the um, person traveled in as well. Um, next slide, please. So then staff commuting. So this is the transportation of employees between their homes and their work sites. Um, so with the basic level, you can take assumptions on habits using the national averages and multiply by the number of staff you have. And then the advanced level is collecting actual data through a staff commuting survey, for example. Next slide. We then have staff homeworking. So this obviously has been a major area since the pandemic, um, but it's very much an emerging area in terms of carbon emissions. So there is a default emission factor that you can use as a basic leg of level, um, but then EcoAct have brought out some guidance which includes office equipment, heating and cooling as well. As I say, this is an emerging area, so we aim to have better guidance um, for this area moving forward. Next slide, please. So then we have student travel. So this is obviously the transportation of students to the institution. So this is daily commuting as well as start and end of term, as, and this includes international travel as well. So depending on your institution, what, how many international students you have, um, you, so you have to include the travel for them to come to the UK, and then also the commuting from their um, accommodation um, to, to the university or the college as well on a daily basis. So again, the basic level, there's an assumption that you can base it on a national average, and a good practice is to include two return flights per annum. A more advanced level could be student travel survey, and you can use actual data that you would already be collecting in terms of what is the country of origin of the international students, and then you can do a calculation based on the, um, the carbon to fly from that uh, capital city, for example, to the capital city in the UK where your institution is at. Next slide, please. So in terms of the next phases for the carbon reporting framework is that the Department for Education are developing a data collection tool. This is likely to replace the 
um, sex management record, the EMR, um, and the DFE are working with JISC, uh, which HESA currently um, does the EMR, and then they sit under JISC now. Um, at the moment, it's not mandatory to do the reporting, but it is very much expected that this will become so um, in the in the very near future. So it is really now for the institutions to get up to speed and start their current reporting. The DFE also aims to replace any other reporting requirements that institutions might already be reporting against, such as the EMR uh, or the SECR. Um, and they are talking to the devolved nations. So at the moment, um, this is an England only because education is a devolved matter, but they are very much talking to the other nations and very much hoping that this will be a UK wide um, framework and it would also cross uh, all education providers um, as well, not just universities and colleges. Next slide, please. So there is further support coming. So the Department for Education are developing guidance on how to um, develop a climate action plan, which all institutions have to have in place by 2025 as per their strategy. EAUC are also working with BUFDOG, which is Finance Directors Group, and ORD, which is a Director of States Group, and developing some costings guidance and a calculator. And that's really going to help support institutions in able to cost out their net zero plan. Um, so that will be coming, sorry, apologies, that says April, it's coming later this month in May. Um, and there's lots of activity and um, sharing back pra best practice from the EAUC and all our members on our website for various carbon reduction activities. And you can access this standardized carbon emissions framework on our website. Next slide. Yep. That's, my, that's me done with. So any other questions or um, any comments and I'll hand back over to you. Thank you very much, Fiona. That was brilliant. Hopefully that has uh, shed a bit more light on the commuting component. Um, in terms of questions, guys, just remember there is a Q&A box on the taskbar at the bottom of the screen. We have got a few moments left of Fiona's time, so if any do come in, please do put those in now. There's one here with an anonymous attendee just asking which category of Scope 3 student travel flights commuting falls under, Fiona. So I may as well um, ask that one to you. Um, Uh, just bear with me. I'm just pulling it up to make sure I give definitely the right um, answer to that. Um, so that is coming under. Um, so business travellers, of course. So business travel. Um, and then you have uh, the staff, staff commuting, staff home working is coming under employee commuting. And then uh, the student travel and international travel comes under uh, number nine, which is the downstream transportation and distribution. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Fiona. We have a few more questions coming in, so I'm going to do them in, in order. So um, there's a uh, question here around from Laura Rose, when the costings guidance and calculator will come? Uh, hopefully by the end of this month, early next month. Um, so we're just making the final changes to that. Um, we've been out uh, testing the calculator tool um, with the sector. Um, so following that feedback, we're just making a few changes and I'd say that'll be out very soon in the next few weeks. Thank you very much. Uh, Theresa Curtis would like to, um, has said here, when you say basic survey is using a national average, um, where do you refer to for the national average? Uh, basically, you can get all the guidance and all the links into uh, that I refer to in the in the methodology guidance in the standardised carbon emissions framework. So there's various links in there that can help you um, find out the right data for you. So there, there are national averages that you can utilise. Um, obviously, that isn't particularly accurate. Um, there would be averages. Um, so many institutions would do um, a staff travel uh, or a staff travel and student travel surveys, for example. Um, and obviously you're not going to get 100% return on those either. Um, um, but again, that would be that would be a better accurate 
way of looking at averages for your institution. Also making sure that you use data that you've already got. So you will have data within your institution in terms of where do your students come from, you know, through your HR and your um, uh, departments that manage all your student recruitment. So really go and talk to those departments because they will already have a wealth of data that you can use, which then you can apply um, the car relevant carbon emissions and, and, and what have you. So as I was saying about the international students, you can work out their country of origin um, much more accurately. So that you're not completely relying on, on the student um, travel survey data, for example. Brilliant. Thank you, Fiona. We've got two more, both of which I'd like to ask you, which is, uh, first of all, um, will uh, what will the DfE do with the results of the data collection and would there be any penalties? At the moment, it's not mandatory, so there won't be any penalties at the moment. Um, but as I say, there is expectation, especially as the government gets close to their net zero targets um, in, in, in this and obviously the public sector um, have, have a huge um, influence on that um, and responsibility. So there will be increasing demands of that. What that will look like, I don't know in terms of penalties, whether they link that to funding potentially, um, but it could be also a requirement, you know, to receive funding, you have to have a climate action plan, you have to have a net zero plan, um, um, for example. But at the moment, as I say, it's not mandatory, um, but it is very much a, a recommendation for institutions to start doing it. Fabulous. And of course, you know, if we can get sectoral consistency, then that's helpful for everyone. So Rosalyn has asked here as well that student travel uh, to study um, a mission assumption of two journeys a year means that the institutions would need to take ownership of students travelling home at Christmas, even though that would be their you know, independent choice, not a result of their operations. And so I, I suppose that is a question. Is that the case? Yeah, so we recommend um, as part for, of the standardised carbon emissions framework that two return flights uh, is a good um, best practice approach because that kind of does include that time. For example, like at Christmas when, you know, your campus might actually close for Christmas. So even though you're not telling the student that they have to go home, it might be that there's barriers in place for the student to actually stay on campus. Um, because all of the facilities are closed, for example, um, and so therefore that's kind of almost forcing them to go home. And yeah. so we say two return flights per year uh, would, would be sort of best practice. Um, obviously, that you've got to include at least one because they've got to come here and then go back. Um, so, but in fact, in factoring in that, we we do recommend that you include two return flights. There is, of course, a wider recommendation to try and reduce that to an average of 1.5 longer term. So, um, but of course, that's a separate session. We hope to later in the year do another session um, where hopefully we can delve into a bit more detail uh, into that. So um, Jane Cornelius has asked if there'll be a copy of the presentation. I'm sure um, we'll be able to share that. If you email into Mobility Ways, uh, the details will be there at the end. Any questions that are unanswered, any further information you'd like sharing, we'll We'll get that over to you. Um, Fiona, I'm going to have to say thank you very much. I'm sorry to anyone who's got any unanswered questions. Once again, you can get those over to us at, at uh, the end of the session on email, uh, but we're going to have to move on now. Thanks once again, Fiona. Pleasure to have you with us. Uh, all the best. Thank you. Pleasure. Marvellous. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Jackson. So. We heard from there from Fiona about the Accelerating Towards Net Zero report. Um, and many of you watching today would have con contributed to that. One of the 14 recommendations to government was to require all local councils to consult with local universities and large colleges on their sustainable transport plans to adequately represent the needs and impact of the broad education community. Now it's clear that a collaborative approach with local authority, anchor institutions, large regional employers on commuting can wield enormous benefits. And I'd now like to introduce uh, the first in our spotlight session. Uh, we have Sarah Williams, Principal Transport Planner at Gloucestershire County Council, Anne O'Driscoll, Consultant at Active uh, Businesses Gloucestershire, and Dr John Furley, Sustainable Operations Manager at the University 
of Gloucestershire. We're going to talk to us a bit more about the Active Travel Gloucestershire Business Engagement Initiative. Uh, thanks for being with us, guys. I'll hand over to you now. Um, so yeah, just just um, to set the scene in Gloucestershire, um, in May 2019, the county declared a climate em emergency. Um, we then had COVID um, in March 2020. Um, so there's been a big, huge impact on um, the way people travel and commute in the county since then. By 2030, there's a target to reduce emissions um, by 80%. And by 2050, the county has said that they plan to be carbon neutral. So next slide, please. And the slide after, yeah. Um, so this just sort of shows you some the greenhouse uh, gas emissions by sector uh, nationally. Transport's been the one area consistently over time that has just not seen any significant reduction. There's been lots of advances around energy and, and, and other areas, but transport's been that really sticking point that's just not seen any, any mm -hmm. enough change. Uh, all Gloucestershire councils have now declared a climate emergency. Um, and these are Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, original um, official transport and environment statistics, which were published in October 2022. Figure, 22, uh, figure two shows that transport became the largest emitting sector in 2016 and that emissions remain relatively static. There was obviously a dip in 2020 during the pandemic, but those figures have risen again. And although we're see we've seen a reduction in peak hour traffic, people are still traveling the same amount. Um, figure three shows transport emissions in comparison to other sectors as a percentage. So this just gives you an idea of the scale of the emissions that transport um, present for us. Uh, the data, um, that this has provided and a path to carbon zero study that we undertook at GCC have helped us to understand the gap in our current emissions and where we need to be to achieve carbon zero. So if we could move to the next slide, please. Um, this slide you'll see has the old 2045 um, target date on it. However, in May 2019, Parliament actually declared a climate emergency and the government amended the act um, for carbon new to become carbon neutral by 2050. So as I said, GCC commissioned a study to identify the county's path to car to achieve carbon zero. And this study identified that mid-length trips of around 10 miles for rural districts are one of the highest contributors to carbon in Gloucestershire. Um, in Gloucestershire, almost 60% of transport emissions are from car travel. Freight accounts for about 40%, then smaller goods vehicles and bus and rail um, account for a tiny amount of emissions. So just stopping carbon by 2050 isn't enough, or in 2050 isn't enough. We need to stay within our carbon budget moving forward. And any delay in action is obviously going to make this intervention even more challenging for us. The scale of the ambition that's actually required is if we all switch to electric vehicles in every sector and we all drive more economically and we increase car sharing by a further two and a half percent and we reduce average trip length from about for, from around eight to ten percent and we reduce the number of trips that we all take for around from around um, by around eight to ten percent, and we increase tr public transport by one hundred percent, and we increase active travel by three hundred percent. Then we can just about close that gap in emissions and stay within our carbon budget as we move forward. So to do this, what we require is excellent active travel provision, not a bit of paint here and there really top line facilities. So the images that you can see on the right come from the propensity to cycle tool, which is an online strategic planning tool funded by the Department for Transport and the Welsh Government. And they, it provides um, an evidence base to inform cycling investment. And this evidence base shows us on the top 2011 um, image, current levels of cycling. And you can see that um, 
the darker of the of the pinky red color, the lower the level of cycling, the closer we get to yellow, we get sort of um, 10 to 16 percent cycling. And then the more blue it gets, the higher the level of cycling is. So this is showing that in a go Dutch scenario, which is infrastructure and culture, the same as the Netherlands, but taking account of UK topography and average trip lengths, we can have a massive impact on cycling if we put really, really high quality infrastructure on the ground. And on the third slide, the e-bike slide, you can see that if we then, on top of having that exceptional infrastructure, massively increase e-bike use and get a really good uptake, then we can start to move the, towards the type of figures that we need to see um, to achieve the increase so that we can make our way towards um, carbon zero. Um, so yes, this slide is just uh, talking about the structure of um, our plans and policies at the County Council and how we um, follow our path to carbon zero. So at the top is the local transport plan that I mentioned that we're responsible with, um, for, which sets out the vision for transport in Gloucestershire, which we write in the um, transport planning team. And underneath that are plans like local cycling and walking infrastructure plans, which set out the corridors that we've identified to be the priority for putting infrastructure on, and also an overarching cycling infrastructure plan, which looks countywide at some of the more rural um, areas of our county. And um, then of course we need funding to deliver all those things. And those we tend to secure um, through several means, but the bulk of our funding comes from central government through the Active Travel Fund and the Capability Fund. And it's the Capability Fund that I will now talk to you about. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, so the questions that we need to ask ourselves when trying to deliver change in the county um, is what are our current travel needs? So how are we currently traveling to work and how often are we traveling in? We also need to understand what can influence our travel behavior. And that can be things like um, the needs of our employer, you know, requiring us to be in X number of days a week, or that could be our own personal responsi responsibilities. The choices we make about travel could be influenced by our, our budget, our family budgets, um, and also the avail availability of, of, of services and safe infrastructure. And then we need to also understand what's the potential to travel more actively and sustainably. Are there public transport services taking us from where we live to where we need to be? Um, and are those services for cycling um, safe and secure? And then what's the potential to reduce the need to travel? You know, do we need to make the journey in the first place? We're having this webinar um, online now. Um, you know, Pre-pandemic, this could have been a, a meeting somewhere centrally located and that would, that would have involved a lot of travel. So we need to think about, do we need to go into the office? Can we have our meetings in other ways? So just with some of the, trying to find some of those answers, we um, launched into the Capability Fund project. Next slide, please. So the project that we delivered um, really had three main areas of focus. The first area I'll touch on is collaboration. So in order to generate the collaboration between the county council and their main employers and businesses in the area, we set up something called Active Businesses Gloucestershire, which is basically a business network um, that focuses primarily on um, businesses located in the major urban areas of Cheltenham and Gloucester. And we chose those areas because that is where some new cycling um, infrastructure is going in and will provide people with some new alternative ways to, to get around. So we want to work with those businesses to make sure that um, we can engage them in understanding um, how their businesses travel. We can collaborate and share best practice and information across those organizations. And we've chosen quite a wide range of organizations to get involved. So John represents the, the university on this group. We also have um, uh, the health, health sector represented. We've got major employers and we've got the county and the, the local councils involved as, as well. So that's collaboration. And that's really, really key because the county council is, you know, may, may set the targets for decarbonization for the area, but they can't deliver it alone. They need everybody and everyone to take their, their part. So um, the next bit we looked at very much was data. Um, and we delivered something that we called the Mobility Ways Gloucestershire Program. And that was working with 10 of our members to really understand how their staff and students, in the case of John, were traveling to and from their, their, their place of education or employment. Um, we also did some additional 
um, scoping, which was taking postcode data from employers and mapping what sort of the art of the possible was. So if everybody could use the most sustainable mode of travel that was available to them, what would that look like? And what would that, what mode shift would that help deliver? And then we also offered some personalized travel planning and that's helping people make individual choices and understand what options they have open to them. And also some action planning. And then as, as well as part of all that, it helps the businesses taking part to, mem uh, to, to measure their current commuting um, emissions level and those involved in the scoping were able to look at what their opportunity, um, uh, ACLO, um, active commuting emissions level could be if everybody chose those more sustainable ways to travel. Next slide, please. Um, and then there's a whole raft of support that we, we, we put alongside of this as well. So we offer businesses uh, match funding up to two and a half thousand pounds to help get more staff walking and cycling. So some um, organizations like John's here have decided to put in some new secure cycle parking on site. Others have put in new shower facilities. Some have um, re refurbished their uh, pool bike scheme to um, loan bikes out to staff to try before they buy. There's a whole raft of uh, measures that, that businesses brought in. We also offered a range of travel, um, active travel events. So that was free adult cycle training, organized lead rides, lead walks, and travel roadshow for employees to engage them on their options and their travel uh, opportunities to travel more sustainably to work. And then we're also involved in Love to Ride, which is a, a, a national, uh, well, it's an international portal um, designed to get more people cycling more often. Um, we're at the stage now where we are entering the next uh, phase of this, this project, and we're now combining all the individual um, results that the businesses had from their travel to, sur uh, to work survey and really looking at what the common themes across all the surveys were and identify where we understand that there's gaps, whether it's in um, bus services or frequency of services or new infrastructure to make cycling and walking um, more viable for people as well. And we're looking to engage with a whole range of partners on trying to, to deliver that and provide the evidence for it. Um, we've also got some, um, some more support available for businesses. Um, coming up and there's going to be um, an e-pool bike loan scheme that's going to be launched that will travel between employers to enable um, yeah, people to try, as I say, before, before they buy. And we're also going to be doing a big promotion around um, lift sharing in Gloucestershire in the autumn. So that's sort of our project now. And I'll just pass over to John, who can give you his experience of being involved in this. So next slide, please. And I think that, and we'll go to the next one as well, because that just says who I am. We know that now. <clears throat> Thank you. I thought I'd set the scene slightly just by kind of saying generally about what, what our overall net zero position is and where we're headed. So, you know, we, we took our baseline as 2018. We want to be as close to net zero as we can by 2030. And if you look at the chart on the right hand side, it shows really that for our 2018 baseline, 32% of our emissions come from travel alone. So it tells us that that's you know, an area we really wanted to focus on. And if we go to the next slide, I'll start talking about where we were and then how, how the Active Businesses Gloucestershire approach has really helped. So we've surveyed staff and students for five years, six years now, really since 2017. So we have a lot of data and we haven't really been able to implement any real change in, in the emissions levels from those commutes other than the change that's kind of nationally happened where there's more EVs on the road, you know, COVID helped a lot, obviously. But, but one of the main problems we really had is trying to find that sort of collective approach because lots of things we need to do need to involve the county council. Finding routes into the county council were sometimes a challenge. Um, we were connected to other businesses, but not around the kind of commute and emissions conversation. So the problems we were we were facing, we we weren't aware that others were in exactly the same boat as us, really. So, I mean, I'm sure you can read through the slide there. There's a lot of words there, but really it was, you know, we had a lot of data. We had internal discussions, but we had nowhere to go outside very easily. So if we go to the next slide, I'll start talking about, you know, how that coordinated approach has helped. So we, we launched our net zero policy in 2021 based on the 2018-19 emissions level because of the impact on COVID. And we were particularly fortunate this year round because we've done five years of surveying before, but our internal surveying resource moved to a different job. 
and it was a single point of failure. So having Active Businesses Gloucestershire come along and the Mobility Wage Survey tool was really opportune for us. I think it's done some additional things. So our old survey, you know, it was it was in-house. We had very similar questions to what we've used with Mobility Ways, but we didn't have so much power in the kind of backroom analysis and, and the tools that came with that survey. So there was a really big plus there as well. We actually understand much more about our, our travel patterns, our people's behaviours and the opportunity to change than we did before. And we could have done that just by kind of joining in mobility ways ourselves, but actually the real benefit has come about by having those discussions in the active businesses meetings that, that Anne helps run and then that sort of forum where the county council comes. So now there's a, you know, a, a much bigger data set. And I think, you know, all, all of the, the 10 companies that have done the surveys, you know, the data will be pulled into a overall picture and report. But now we've, we, you know, we all know now that, that even, even the journey that Gloucester has been on, where we've in, we're installing a new cycleway between the two main towns in Gloucester, which is Gloucester and Cheltenham, that has brought some pain because obviously there's continuous roadworks along a B road for about two or three years. But actually having the ability to sit together and discuss that and know that actually everyone's feeling a bit of pain, but it's for a good reason. And then the county can hear the issues and make some changes to how the roadworks work. That's really helped as well, I think. But I, th I think the main one really is, it's given us a joined up approach. It's given us an approach to talk openly and honestly with the council as a group of, pe of businesses. And I feel like have our voice more easily heard. It may have been heard in the past, but it just feels like it's getting across more easily. I think one of the main questions we still have probably is, will it work? I'm confident it will. And I'm gonna look to Anne because she's sort of leading the charge. But actually, you know, I, I feel like we've got a much bigger opportunity now and a much better chance of actually making change happen and encouraging all the residents of Gloucestershire to to travel in a in as net zero way as possible. Whereas before that door wasn't really widely open. And I think, you know, today I was pleased today because Anne's come and joined us at the university. She's travelled a fair way, but she's travelled by electric vehicle. So that's a good start on the net zero emissions. I've cycled here. You know, the rest of you are joined remotely. I think that's all for the good. But I do think kind of having, if every council or county could generate this joined up approach, I do believe we'd have a much bigger chance of making a change happen. I don't think there's really another slide, but I'll, if you go to the next one, just in case. Ah, uh, yes, that's just about, you know, what other resources we have. So, you know, if you go to our website, you'll be able to find kind of various sustainability reports and net zero strategy. Um, and I think the last slide I've got really just covers what the scopes are in case we hadn't talked about already, but we have, so we don't need that one really. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, guys. That was really insightful. Um, key thing that I took from that is the power of data and the collaborative approach and actually what, you know, what insights we can glean from that. I suppose the key thing now is how do we apply it? And a uh, question in from Noel Fernandez is that you know, most councils are reducing public travel services, not increasing them. So uh, the question is really how we can influence this change to revert back to it and, and actually increasing these services. So um, I suppose the question I'd like to put is actually how, um, how the university and uh, Gloucestershire and, and other institutions around the country, um, really the benefit from the, the, the big data piece and, and how that can help influence council's decision making when it comes to, to funding. So is there anyone who'd like to take that one on? Um, John and I'll take that one. Um, I think what's interesting to know is we have Stagecoach, um, which is one of the main bus operators um, involved in Active Businesses Gloucestershire, and they're very keen to meet with us and to explore the data and understand um, where that potential new um, revenue stream can, can come from. So they're quite keen to work with us to try and help us plug some of those gaps and get more people on buses. So they're very much part of the network, which is really, really important for its ultimate success. And I suppose the second part of the answer is from, from directly from our university's point of view. So we, we're moderately unusual, we're small, but we do have four campuses spread across two towns. So there's a lot of travel that could occur. The majority of our students do travel by bus or walk. 
So there's there's a big market there for, for Stagecoach and the other bus providers. But we, in the past, we've used our travel survey data to, to have those conversations with the bus provider around bus pass opportunities, subsidies, stuff like that. And the same with the council. But actually, again, I think with the active businesses kind of approach, it's given us a much more direct way in. And oddly enough, at this very moment, we are in conversations with Stagecoach around how we can do things. Um, but it always goes back to the data because the bus company has some data, but they don't really know, you know, they kind of know it's a student bus pass. They don't really know was it one of our students or one of the other FE providers in, in the area. Whereas actually we can go back to them and say, we know this percentage of our students travel from this place to this place by this means. So it's really that data bit. And I do think it will come more into play as we collectively start having the conversation with the council around, okay, Gloucestershire is suffering from the same thing where bus services are changing, definitely. And that's the wrong direction. So it's how do we give the council the data to say, no, we need to go back to central government and get this funded somehow. If I could um, just add to that as well, that it's not actually Gloucestershire County Council who's been reducing those services. Um, public transport is a private sector. And although we... Um, subsidise a lot of routes across the county. Unfortunately, some of our operators have decided that they are no longer financially viable. And as John says, what we need is more support from central government so that we can offer even more subsidy. And what we also need is more uptake so that people are using those services rather than travelling by private vehicle. I suppose this is where we get into, you know, informing people of their options. And I suppose a number of the services that we talked about earlier, the data piece will, will help with that. Um, there are a number of questions in there. We're going to um, answer some of those uh, in the chat box. But um, unfortunately, we'd love to get through them, but we have got a bit of a tight, we're a bit tight for time now. So we're going to have to move on. But thank you. All three of you, uh, Sarah and John, for your time today. Really appreciate it. Hopefully, um, our attendees have found, uh, found some, some, some useful info in there. We're now going to move on to Simon Chubb, Head of Sustainability at Anglia Ruskin University. Um, of course, as part of the, uh, similarly with a the common theme with the accelerating uh, towards net zero report, one of the action pathways for travel and transport listed under further action and outcomes was student and staff engagement and really how the sector should encourage more sustainable travel choices on campus through staff and student engagement. And that could include investing in behavior change research programs to understand how to shift mindsets around current travel practices. Um, ARU Green, ARU Green is an interactive program for all employees and students at Anglia Ruskin University. Um, Simon's here to tell us more about it. Um, Simon, over to you. Thank you, Finlay. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation for us to uh, come and share our experiences with ARU Green. So uh, yeah, next slide, please. And I think probably next slide as well, please. Okay, so yeah, Anglo Ruskin University. So we host um, about 18,000 students on our four main campuses in Cambridge, Chelmsford, Peterborough, and London. Uh, and we employ about 1,800 full-time equivalent uh, members of staff on those campuses. Um, with respect to travel, uh, so we now have no car parking uh, on our campuses in Cambridge and London. Uh, and students and new members of staff are no longer able to access our limited car parking uh, in Chelmsford and Peterborough. So we're therefore very reliant on public transport services and active travel uh, for staff and students to access our campuses. So over the past decade, we've invested uh, quite heavily in our sustainable travel planning uh, with, with measures that you're probably familiar with. So, uh, you know, lots of uh, secure cycle parking, showers and lockers, um, cycling and public transport discounts, uh, interest-free loans. Uh, and we have worked with our local authorities to bring park and ride services and bus services um, onto our campuses. So this is half the number of staff and students arriving on our campuses alone by car since 2011. So less than 15% uh, uh, nowadays uh, and earned as numerous 
local and national travel planning awards. Uh, next slide, please. So we've been on our sustainability journey for quite some time now at, at ARU. Uh, in 2009, we were one of the first universities in the UK to gain certification to the International Environmental Management Standard, ISO 14001. And that really provides the framework for all of our sustainability activity at Anglia Ruskin, including our travel planning and our staff and student engagement programs. Um, so yeah, up to 2017, uh, we were working with the National Union of Students on their staff student engagement programs called Green Impact and Student Switch Off. Um, but in 2018, we really wanted to develop our approach to better reflect our own staff and student demographic and the sort of distributed nature of our campuses. So in 2018, we engaged uh, an organization called JUMP uh, to help us develop our ARU Green program. Uh, we trialed that with uh, two of our faculties and services amongst staff uh, in 2018, which proved very successful. Uh, so in April 2019, we rolled out this program to all staff in all of our faculties and services across our campuses, and also engaged our students uh, as well. So later that same year, September 2019, uh, we also declared a climate and ecological emergency, um, and that prompted the strengthening of our sustainability strategy uh, to become much more ambitious. Uh, so we spent a year uh, working with staff and students across our campuses to, uh, to develop a new strategy that was launched in November 2020. Um, so that has a target to become zero carbon, not net carbon, but zero carbon uh, by 2045, including scope three emissions uh, without the use of carbon offsetting. Uh, so that includes our business travel and commuting emissions. Uh, next slide, please. So our approach to behavior change at AIU really begins with a rejection of the information deficit model uh, shown on the left of this slide, uh, which, which pretty much states that if you provide uh, people with correct information, either through posters or pamphlets or emails or whatever it might be, um, they will adopt the desired uh, behavior. Our approach at ARU is reflected more in the Venn diagram on the right uh, of this slide, showing how our behavior is influenced by our own individual values, attitudes and beliefs, um, our social environment, including peer group pressure and praise, uh, but also our physical environment. So without the necessary facilities or infrastructure available at the right time and price, we can't expect people to adopt the kind of behaviors um, that we desire. So ARU Green is designed to complement the kind of physical infrastructure that I mentioned earlier, like cycle parking and campus bus stops, um, to build the social capital uh, for sustainable behavior change and to overcome some of the barriers that we've experienced previously, uh, including engaging people across our multiple campuses hundreds of miles apart, uh, preaching to the converted, and also being able to provide quantified feedback on the impact of people's actions. So that was a key part of feedback that we got from the previous approaches that we were using to engage uh, staff and students. So next slide, please. So this is what our ARU Green program includes. Uh, so it's web-based, um, but it can also be accessed through a mobile app. Uh, people collect points for completing a range of sustainable behaviors and compete both as individuals and teams to collect the most points. It includes bi-monthly webinars on topics which reflect our sustainable communications program uh, and points are awarded both for attendance and completing a follow-up quiz. So our last webinar in March focused on World Water Day and the next one coming up at the end of this month focuses on people power, uh, covering campaigning and volunteering opportunities. Um, it also has an integrated car sharing platform, uh, which again, people can uh, earn points from using. And there's also a monthly challenge, which again reflects our annual sustainability events calendar, 
and keeps the program fresh, maintaining motivation and engagement. So our current monthly challenge is a biodiversity photography uh, competition. And then June's will be rewarding people for participating in our green move out and donating unwanted items to the British Heart Foundation. Uh, next slide, please. So this screenshot shows the priority behaviours related to sustainable travel. Uh, points are awarded for journeys completed by active travel, public transport, car sharing, or trips avoided by meeting virtually. Uh, our other themes relate to getting involved, um, energy, carbon, uh, health and well-being, waste minimization, and responsible purchasing. And throughout the platform, information is provided about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So in this case, it's the link with SDG 11, uh, Sustainable Cities and Communities. Um, and participants commit to whichever behaviours they feel able to complete. And then every week they confirm which they've actually completed, either through the app or the website. Uh, a weekly reminder email is sent to all participants, reminding them to record their actions and a monthly newsletter is sent informing them of our collective impact and the position of their team in the leaderboard. It also publicizes the theme of forthcoming monthly challenges, webinars, as well as current sustainability news or achievements at AIU. Uh, and it's proved really effective uh, for creating a sustainability community in our university. Uh, next slide, please. So prizes are awarded every month to the two students and staff members with the most points earned that month, that month, which is a £10 voucher for B&Q, M&S, local independent shops, or they can choose to donate to charities. Monthly raffle prizes are also awarded randomly to maintain motivation and engagement. Um, and these are the form of reusable uh, cups and bottles and vouchers to use in campus restaurants and sports facilities. And then at the end of the academic year, the staff and student teams with the most points each get to award a hundred pound voucher to a charity of their choice, which they vote on throughout the year. So we've previously donated to the Essex Wildlife Trust, Chelmsford Food Bank, Jimmy's Night Shelter in Cambridge, and also Cancer Research UK. And next slide, please. So our AIU Green programme currently has about 1,800 participants split, split roughly equally between staff and students. This screen shows the impact of the AIU Green programme and is available to all participants to interrogate. They can see their own individual impact or the impact of their team or the collective impact of all participants for different selected behaviours. So this screen focuses on active travel behaviours and shows the collective impact of all participants across AIU for the past 12 months. So this shows that there were over 455,000 active journeys uh, completed over the past year, over 9,000 cross-campus trips made by public transport or car sharing, saving 146 tonnes of carbon dioxide. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so... So that's it. I hope I've given you a flavor of what our AIU Green Behavior Change program involves, um, but we think it's become a very effective part of our broader efforts to create a sustainability culture at AIU. But yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Simon. That was brilliant. Um, we are pretty much strapped to time for time, but we've got one question here which is around uh, verifying eligibility for rewards, which is, um, so we have our own methods, but it would be interesting to understand how you guys are doing that with ARU Green. So elig eligibility for rewards, I mean, it's essentially um, collection of points. Uh, so, you know, people collect points uh, through the month. So prizes are awarded on a monthly basis. Um, and then for teams, it's on an annual basis. And then the team with the most points gets to award. But um, yeah, essentially, um, it's all through the system. So it's all, you know, totting up points. Research is undertaken uh, on an annual basis to sort of try and identify manipulation, I suppose, um, of the system. So we, we do do spot checks uh, occasionally. We, you know, we accept that, you know, there will be a small minority of people sort of trying to gain, this, gain the system. But um, 
you know, we, we, we do try and keep an eye out for that. But overall, uh, you know, we feel that the impact of, of the system sort of justifies, you know, that, that small element that might be trying to gain the system. And do you feel that the, some of the extrinsic rewards are a real driver for the users or is it really the buy into the sustainable kind of ethos that's, that's working or is it a mixture of both? It, yeah, very much a mixture of both. You can kind of tell the participants who really are, you know, in it for the competition and earning as many points as they like. But really, you know, it it, it goes with all forms of behavior change and engagement that we're all sort of motivated by, you know, what's in it for me, what's in it for my team, what's in it for my organization, and then also, you know, the broader kind of social and environmental gains. And it's it will always be a mixture of those. So if you can come up with a program that hits all of those buttons, uh, you know, rather than just one, then, you know, that's that's really the kind of winning strategy that we're aiming for. Fabulous. Thank you very much. I'm really sorry to anyone who's answered the question. We have got a number of questions coming in for for Simon, we will, of course, once again, if you email uh, in uh, to team at mobilitywage.com, we'll make sure we get all of those answered for you. Um, Simon, thank you ever so much uh, for your time. Great presentation. Um, we're going to have to move on, however, uh, to the next session. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jordan Harold, lecturer from the University of East Anglia and Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research, as we move um, quite nicely into our behavior change uh, session, and we're gonna look at some participatory approaches. So Jordan, over to you. Thank you, Finn, and um, welcome. Um, hello to everyone. Um, I suppose just to provide some, some context, my background is in science communication, uh, particularly to support and enable societal change in response to the challenges of climate change. And, as we've already heard today, you know, we have a gap in terms of the scale of action that's needed, um, not only at a global and national level, but also at a local level. Um, but we also have another gap, and that is um, between people's beliefs and attitudes and our behaviours. So the good news is that we know most people um, are aware of climate change. They see it as an a, a, um, uh, an issue that um, is concerning and important to address. And when you ask people, they say they hold pro-environmental values, pro-environmental attitudes, and generally do support um, government and organizations action around climate change. But on the flip side, we know that existing habits persist and are difficult to change. So, you know, particularly um, it's been highlighted, you know, in terms of commuting, that the kind of scale of action isn't there yet in terms of sort of addressing um, and achieving the plans towards net zero goals. Um, but this is true in many other domains of our lives. So um, also for thinking about changing diets uh, to more sustainable diets um, and consumption of goods um, and use of energy in our, in our daily lives as well. So this gap between our values, our attitudes and our behaviours, how do we close that gap? And kind of the key point that I want to cover in my talk today is to essentially argue that to support sustainable travel behaviours, um, part of the solution to this is through what I call participatory approaches. Um, and essentially what that means is moving beyond um, communication and engagement activities to directly involve um, members of organizations, so students and staff, in the co-design and the co-delivery of those sustainable transport policies and plans. So I can have the next slide, please. Thank you. So why do we need participatory approaches? Well, we know from um, psychological literature and the research, but also from practice, that you know, a lot of the um, existing approaches that have been tried and tested um, do have a role. They can provide useful changes in behavior, but when we look at the scale of action and change, scale of change in behavior that's needed, um, they, they tend to have limited effectiveness. So you know, informational approaches alone, just providing information, that kind of assumes as um, mentioned by Simon, you know, that's not going to actually 
um, enable people to, to change their habits. And you'd also think about those social aspects and the infrastructure aspects as well. Um, another approach, you know, incentives. So again, we just heard um, about, you know, this uh, opportunity to reward people, to reinforce um, sustainable behaviours. Well, I think, you know, there is a role for that, but I think there are potential challenges around that too. We know that there might not be the, um, um, the funding, the support for those rewards to be around forever. And perhaps, you know, if we were trying to scale that up, that might be a bit more difficult. The other potential risk is that they tend to act on extrinsic motivation. So we know that this, um, there's some emerging evidence that suggests that this might crowd out our pre-existing pro-environmental motivations. And that might be important to actually harness those environmental motivations, those reasons for, for changing our behaviour, um, for sort of spillover to other domains of behaviour, um, thinking about diet and so on. We also know um, disincentives are unpopular. So, um, you know, reducing the amount of parking spaces, for example, um, increasing the costs for parking, to try and encourage people to switch to other forms of transport. Um, these often can be contentious, um, sometimes raise issues around fairness, about uh, the extent to which those decisions can impact different groups. So I think these are sort of real sort of you know, challenges when perhaps partly the reason why existing approaches haven't yet sort of achieved the, the scale of behavior change um, that's needed. Now, I think, you know, these approaches have a place. Indeed, um, most recent IPCC report highlighted that to reduce car use, disincentives are part of the solution, but they must be coupled with viable alternatives for people. And really, to enable people to switch, those alternatives need to address people's needs. So um, we know that if people have positive emotions towards the alternative options, people are going to be much more responsive of engaging them. So when we think about um, you know, more active travel, use of public transport, as has already been highlighted by other um, talks today, you know, getting the infrastructure in place to ensure that those options are convenient, um, easy to do, um, affordable and so on are really key. But I think you know, there are two challenges here. So, so one is in terms of um, achieving the scale and pace of change that's needed. And the other is where disincentives are applied, how can we avoid the risks that might be associated with them? There are risks um, also to do with psychological reactants. Um, you know, people might uh, feel aggrieved by not being able to, to do their existing behavior. And um, there can sometimes be unexpected consequences too. So, you know, I've known anecdotal examples, for example, where car parking um, has been um, the availability of spaces has been reduced. That's created issues around local communities, around um, sort of um, sort of slightly antisocial parking on the communities around organisations, creating um, conflicts and challenges there. And there's a real um, risk also in terms of um, the risk of distrust between those actually making these decisions and the individuals who are affected by them, so the staff and students of, of universities and so on. So I think part of the solution is embedding participatory approaches in the delivery and design um, of these sorts of interventions and plans to ensure that these challenges are worked through and so that people actually feel involved in part of that process and actually start to have ownership around the decision making um, around these, some of these choices. Next slide, please. And when we think about what participatory approaches are, I think it's useful to acknowledge there are a number of different terms that are used. Um, and I think this ladder of co-production is a really useful tool or a guide to think about the different types of interactions um, between those responsible for um, putting together policies and plans and the individuals that are affected by them. So starting at the bottom there, we've got things like coercion and education. And you know, this is really, as it says there, you know, seeing uh, the role of um, transport users as being individuals who are passive recipients of 
the types of transport services that are available to them. And you know, as we've mentioned already, you know, that's probably not going to be a very effective way of engaging people and supporting people to change behaviour. Moving up the ladder, we have informing people, um, consulting with them and engaging them. And these are really core components, um, really key to any um, sustainable transport planning to ensure that information is communicated in clear and accessible ways. There are opportunities for people to air their views, share their perspectives, identify you know, perhaps challenges of, among different groups that are affected by different um, transport options. Um, but I think there's also a limit and some challenges with only going that far. Um, just by adopting those approaches, there are still power imbalances between the decision makers in an organization and the individuals. Um, and it can you know, sometimes be difficult to actually reach and engage with the diverse communities um, that you know, um, study or work at universities. So I think we also need to think about, you know, are there opportunities for doing, um, developing policies and plans, interventions in a much more equal and reciprocal partnership with transport users? And this is where co-design and co-production come in. So co-design, as it suggests, involves actually designing what those um, uh, initiatives, interventions and so on look like. And co-production takes that a step further by actually involving those individuals in the delivery and planning and implementation of the solutions. And I think there are you know, really good benefits that this can increase transparency about how decisions are made can help enhance trust within and between organizations. Um, and I think it has some emerging evidence that this has the potential to actually create much more impactful solutions um, and avoid those unexpected consequences of, of sort of launching interventions and finding actually there are teething problems or they don't actually work as perhaps initially anticipated. I think there are a range of benefits of, of participatory approaches um, as well. You know, there's greater opportunity the more you involve people to identify novel and diverse solutions. I think it's important that um, obviously, you know, experts have important expertise and knowledge, um, but so do transport users. There's everyday experiences um, and situations and contexts that people have are really important to integrate within the design and development of, of transport policies. And of course, um, as you involve more and more people and are having a, a very active role, there's um, the opportunity that they become real advocates to share what, what the, the plan is, the interventions, and influence others within the organization. And if I can have the next slide, please. And so briefly, I just wanted to end on a, a couple of things. So um, what does co-production look like? Well, I think it can take many forms in higher education contexts. Um, you know, traditionally, co-production really makes great use of, of workshop type activities, bringing people together to collaboratively work through the problems and possible solutions. But you can also take that further. So, for example, the involvement of transport users on committees, decision making panels, um, involving them as advocates at events and, and outreach activities, um, harnessing them as trusted individuals to actually um, support the ownership of the of the policy within the community and the organization key to these um, this approach is really um, embedding people early and throughout the process so participatory approaches really do emphasize the um, focus on prioritizing process and people above outcomes at the initial stage and the idea is that by um, embracing these approaches the outcomes good outcomes effective outcomes will follow through as a result. Now, of course, there are challenges with implementing this, um, you know, just sort of the day to day practice. Um, but I think, you know, the great thing about participating approaches is that people are key assets in actually um, delivering uh, changes in an organization. So building on people's knowledges and capabilities. So thinking about this in a higher education context, you know, fantastic um, student societies 
um, and staff groups who are really motivated and interested, there's opportunities to harness and, and collaborate and work with those groups. There are opportunities to partner with staff involved in teaching delivery through developing student projects, student volunteer opportunities, and student internships, for example. And of course, as briefly been mentioned earlier, um, the role of academic institutions as anchor organisations and the wider communities and groups that exist that are able to partner with and actually bring into the decision making process. And then just to end on sort of one key co-benefit of this is, you know, we hear a lot around um, with wider awareness and engagement around climate change and the challenges that poses. We know particularly younger generations say that they're feeling um, you know, negative emotions. And we're increasingly hearing about eco worry and eco anxiety. And we know that these sorts of participatory, participatory approaches can really help um, enhance people's feelings of control and efficacy over those societal challenges and helping them cope with the negative emotions associated with climate change. So, to sum up, I think embedding participatory approaches can therefore have multiple co benefits not only in promoting and implementing positive action, but also supporting individuals coping and challenging, um, you know, addressing those challenges as we are facing society around climate change. Thank you very much. There we go. Jordan, thank you ever so much. That was fantastic. Um, I would love to chat more about that. I would love to uh, ask questions from our audience, but, Unfortunately, we are uh, quickly approaching the end and we still have our um, exciting behavior change panel to go. So we are gonna move on. Any questions unanswered will get answered, I, I promise. I'd like to welcome back Jordan. Um, and of course, to introduce Lucy Eggleston, who's sustainability, uh, excuse me, sustainability lead, product and transport at Unomia Research and Consulting. Welcome Lucy, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, happy to be here. Brilliant. Well, guys, I'm going to jump straight in. So, of course, uh, behaviour change is, uh, of course, key to, 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 to getting people to travel more sustainably. I think within institutions, there are you know, two sets here, staff and students. And I'd be curious to get your perspectives really on the different approaches that can be taken to elicit behaviour change with those two distinct groups. So, um, Lucy, do you want to, you're new to us here uh, on, on, on this panel, do you want to take that one? Yeah, definitely. Um, a great question. And I think uh, the first thing that springs to mind is, is talking about motivations. And I've been listening in for the past half an hour or so to um, Jordan and others talking about motivating people and finding intrinsic and extrinsic motivations. Um, I think a big component for this, for me, is understanding what motivates students versus what motivates staff, and that the two can be quite different. Um, it's also important to consider differences in travel behaviours. Perhaps staff may be um, traveling more regularly and on more of a schedule, um, a, more of a consistent schedule, whereas students don't always have lectures. Students sometimes might not go in one day and then be in for a full day the next. People living in the same house will have different schedules. And so, the, the manner in which they travel and the manner in which you can persuade them or, and, and help them to choose other, other behaviours is going to be different. Um, so those, I think those are the first things that you need to think about. And once you have a real grasp on particularly those two, those two aspects, so their behaviours and their attitudes, then you can start to think about bespoke methods for perhaps um, encouraging some modal shift or um, exploring alternative ways to be able to study or do their jobs that perhaps don't need them to travel as much. And is there, um, I mean, in terms of, you know, the demography and proximity living, you know, proximity of, of, of where they live perhaps to a university, is there anything that you can see from a research perspective that, um, I mean, do we see any trends? Is active travel, for instance, likely to be more, um, more likely for students to, to, to live nearer? What, what, what can you add? It, I, it, from my experience, it is entirely dependent on the university. Um, you have some universities um, where 
the students are typically located in, in one area when they're living, even not considering campus versus non-campus universities, but if we're talking about students who aren't living on campus, for some universities, they tend to be located around um, hotspots, perhaps there's a particular neighbourhood that's understood to be a student neighbourhood um, that uh, provides a lot of opportunities from a, uh, a university perspective to make sure that there are um, bus routes and cycle lanes and things things like that that link that neighbourhood with the university to enable some of that active travel for students. Um, but then there are some universities where it's completely disparate, perhaps more maybe um, larger city universities where students are more spread out and so it's harder to tackle those, um, it's harder to identify those common pathways and therefore harder to tackle them. Um, but I think that you are, that I think part of the point that you're getting getting to there is that perhaps students tend to live closer to the universities than the staff perhaps. Um, and maybe that is the case, but I, again, I think it does, it does vary. Um, another thing to consider is um, access to vehicles. I think it's a lot less common for students to have cars um, than staff members, but also than most, most other people in their demographic. If you're a young person who's working, you're pro I don't know the stats, but you're more likely, I would assume, to have access to a vehicle than if you're a student um, doing the same. Um, all things to consider. Fabulous. Jordan, did you, um, same question. Yeah, yeah, I can, a um, couple of things to complement what, what Lucy said there. I think just picking up on that point in terms of um, access, um, capability, opportunity of different transport methods, I think is often quite different between those, those staff and student groups. Um, you know, more broadly, we know that those with greater disposable income uh, will have higher carbon footprints and tend to have behaviours um, that are less sustainable because of, you know, the opportunity of being able to actually, you know, afford a car, run a car. Mm -hmm. and so, so I think, you know, thinking about strategies, I think it is important uh, to look at that. And, you know, a number of universities on, you know, um, policies, you know, it's very difficult for often for students to gain parking permits. Um, mm -hmm. Often, you know, staff there might be some restrictions but usually it's, it's more much more accessible than for students so I think looking at staff um, not only because they probably might have a higher carbon footprint but also I think you know I think there's more scope there to actually think about how we can influence and shift um, that group to, to more sustainable patterns and then the other consideration I kind of thought was thinking of was um, when there are opportunities to influence behaviour so those are probably different between those two groups. So if we think about students when they arrive uh, at the university for the first time, those changes in our lives have really got good in, um, opportunities to influence habits. So I think, you know, those are probably going to be slightly different for staff. You know, there might be opportunities when uh, people join an organisation or perhaps when they're moving house. Then those are windows, these moments of change where we can influence behaviour. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. We have at Mobility Ways, of course, our Live Share for Work product and some of our most successful uh, case studies in terms of sheer member uptake and growth are launched at, at key times. And that could be uh, start of a new term, for instance, start of a new year where uh, people are a, a lot more susceptible to, to change their own behavior in line with, in, in line with that big milestone. So um, definitely something to, to consider. So I suppose when we've kind of touched on that in the last question, but I suppose th therefore the engagement with these different groups, both staff and students, but of course demographics within that as well. Um, how, can we, how can we sort of think about engaging different groups um, whether it's staff or students or, or, or culturally, is there any, any, anything you can add? I think, um, I think it's really important that these behaviours, so, so be it transport or other, other behaviours as well, that they are embedded within kind of the activities and, and lives and roles that we have in organisations. So, you know, thinking about opportunities to influence students, you know, you know, there's an increasing movement around embedding sustainability within the curriculum. And I think that starts to open up opportunities to actually um, embrace sort of students um, 
kind of engagement, but also actually sort of opening their eyes and actually how the disciplines, the subjects that they're studying are relevant to supporting or influencing sustainable action and that they do have a, um, a voice in that. And I think that's where kind of the participatory approaches are really valuable and influential that, you know, there are opportunities for teaching, but also there are lots of groups and organisations within universities. So thinking about student societies um, and I think, you know, harnessing working with them, great, you know, a great resource. They'll have fantastic ideas and um, they'll come up with ideas that you haven't thought of before. You'll be able to sort of critique, you know, possible suggestions, help with prioritizing different um, possibilities. So I think it's all about, yeah, sort of harnessing what's there, but then also trying to work out who are the hard to reach groups and actually starting to try and think through how do you reach them? Because that, you know, just as important if not more important, you know, those people who are perhaps less open to change, um, perhaps less motivated, perhaps maybe have less time to, to think about these sorts of issues. Um, and I think, you know, that's really important to build into any, any approach. I think that really, that segues really nicely in, in, into our next question, which is of course that on the whole, uh, younger generations are a lot more climate conscious. And so um, as we move closer to 2050 and if, institutions themselves have got uh, net zero goals sooner than that then as we move closer to that this is only you know that those voices are only going to grow but um i suppose the interesting thing is that staff and students really when it comes to organizational emissions how they travel to work is often the only uh, impact they can actually have themselves but it is requiring change of them and so what would be interesting to know is the psychology behind universities modeling the behaviours expected of staff and students in the wider context of you know, this collective goal to reach net zero. So um, could you uh, take that one on, Jordan, then Lucy will move over to you. Is that OK? Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, there's a whole psychology around leadership um, and really key to that is thinking about um, fostering a collaborative social identity of an organisation. So, you know, I think it's really important that uh, decision makers and organizations, particularly those in a position of, um, of power or, or leadership, um, really actually show and lead by example. Um, that's really important to kind of foster, you know, trusting relationships uh, within organizations. Um, but also, if you don't have that, then I think, you know, it's quite problematic, you know, you end up with psychological reactants, you know, why, why are students being asked to do something that, that staff aren't willing to do themselves? Um, you know, I often you know, think that when I see you know, the amount of um, staff driving you know, to organisations to work, including my own, um, whereas you know, students, you know, and, and we, you know, some students live, um, well, they have diverse personal lives, you know, have caring responsibilities, increasing commitments to work, and so, you know, that regardless of staff or students, there are challenges there. And I think it's important for leadership to um, support staff and students to play an active role. And I think that's the other kind of key thing is with the participatory approaches, um, it takes leadership to provide the space in our working lives or, or students' lives to actually see that as an important um, opportunity and, um, and I think it takes leadership to actually demonstrate that there is uh, a, or factoring that into people's workflows, for example, or, or demonstrating the importance of, of actually engaging in those sorts of things. Thank you very much. And Lucy, the same question to you then. So we're talking about modelling behaviours and actually how institutions was can encourage uh, mm. staff and students to, um, or, 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 or I suppose some of the, when it comes to modelling those behaviours, what? Mm -hmm. What could you add to that from your perspective? Um, I think there's a couple of things and they kind of link back to the earlier question. So I will bring that back in as well. Um, but I think um, one of the things that comes to mind is, yes, there is. We're, we're told that the incoming um, cohort of students are more environmentally conscious. And I, I do believe that. But within that cohort, there is also a range. There are some students who are very environmentally aware and there are others who are perhaps less exposed to it, less familiar with some of the arguments. And um, there's an importance 
it's important to um, model those behaviors to those who are very open to it, but also to those who are less open to it and showing to them, educating them as well and showing them what some of the advantages are. Um, I think a question that I get a lot as a, an environmental um, consultant from some of my friends is, well, what is my difference? What's the point of me changing? What difference am I going to make myself? And um, there's power in knowledge. And I think typically university students appreciate that. And so it's important to share some of those findings that perhaps you're gathering amongst your staff, staff or communicating with your staff. It's important to also share those with students in a manner that's engaging and relatable and meaningful. Um, the other point I wanted to make on this is, is the importance of um, kind of behavior, behavior change schools of thought like um, spillover, uh, like behavior change spillover and environmental spillover specifically. Um, and what that means is um, those who are more inclined or who are already engaging in perhaps environmental practices in, in other areas, maybe they're, for example, very good at recycling. Um, that they are more likely to take up um, other behaviours that are also environmentally driven if the link between them is shown. And so it's not just about addressing um, transport emissions and commuter emissions in isolation, but it's about showing how they fit as part of a bigger picture and how they relate to other areas of your life that you're perhaps already making moves in that space. Um, and that's relative, relevant to staff and student alike. Um, the last point I think is worth making is that the links between lower emission travel and um, lower cost travel are, are direct. And I think there's also benefit to show the direct financial implications that changing some of these behaviours can have um, in terms of the actual cost too. Um, so all of that kind of kind of could be rolled up into education and data, I think, really. But that's those are a couple of points I wanted to make. Thank you very much, Lucy. We are um, conscious of time and we, um, uh, I, I just want to kind of move into our final question. If we've got time, we will go uh, to uh, questions from, from, from our attendees today. But the last question is kind of loops back into the accelerating report and the reduction action pathway chart for travel and transport. It's talking about you know, increased online courses and the amount of course content delivered remotely to be a target of 25% by 2030, 2031. Now, um, of course, we're coming out of the pandemic and of, uh, you know, remote learning is, um, there's some who love it, some who are against it. And I think this is going to be really key to understand actually, um, you know, if remote learning is going to play a significant part in the future, um, really how can institutions encourage uh, students and staff of course delivering those courses to embrace it and um, is there anything that we we can see at the moment that are causing challenges in that area so um, Lucy did you want to carry on with that? Yeah sure um, I think a big thing here is 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 unfortunately it comes down to perception of value for money a lot of the time um, I know that there's been a lot of uproar in the news students asking for um, refunds on fees um, because they've been remote over the pandemic, which obviously isn't anyone's fault, but they have felt like they haven't been receiving the level of service that they should be. And let's be honest, university is expensive now. Um, and so I think the remote has to be balanced with the in-person if people are to feel like they have the traditional university experience and are getting the, the benefits of a traditional university experience. I don't believe that everything has to be in person for them to for, for students to get that feeling, but I do think there needs to be a balance. And that has to be equivalent or at least fair across the different subjects as well. Um, we can't just, for example, put all of the arts online. I don't think that would be that would be kind of a more obvious choice because there is less need for labs um, or actual in-person um making things testing design testing um but one of the major one of the major components of, of arts-based subjects is discussion and, and personal interaction and we need to make sure that that's being maintained um the other aspect of it though and it is a positive one is is the potential that online learning has to improve accessibility of education for a wider range of students um, but with that comes back to the same same point around value for money and perhaps there's a tiered approach that could be taken where it's a 
entirely online based course versus a hybrid course versus an in person course and what can be done to communicate the various benefits of that as you said before there are some people who are going to prefer to be entirely online and if that's something that we can maintain access to education but reduce emissions associated with travel to education then great um, that's the student side on the staff side it's about give, making sure that staff have um, the tools they need to be able to, to deliver content online in an engaging manner, um, for me at least, uh, and that comes down to training, I think. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Lucy. Jordan, same question. Yeah, I mean, just really to compliment that, um, what Lucy said, really um, agree. I think, you know, kind of the pedagogical uh, reasons for doing online or versus in person is, I think, really going to be the main driver around those decisions. Um, I think it is a bit of a mixed picture from student perspective. So I think some students embrace it really well. It gives them flexibility around other commitments. Um, some students really feel they need to be in the room. Um, but there's also, you know, it, it, we kind of, we went through the pandemic where, you know, organizations were really sort of having to embrace a lot of online teaching and I think it's only just sort of the last sort of six months where we're just starting to think through, okay, where are the benefits? Where are the challenges? How do we, what does uh, future delivery of teaching look like? Um, and I don't think there's gonna be a one size fits all approach to that. But I think there are, you know, there are probably sort of really simple things that can be done when sort of thinking in the context of the commute. So if you are gonna have an online component to a course, um, it probably makes sense to have a day or two days or whatever it is that's purely online and your in-person stuff is on certain days so you're not mixing and matching and requiring people to travel constantly in in and out from an, um, to a university so i think there are some sort of considerations around that but i think that balance around the extent that online will actually um continue and how it will be embraced i think also needs to consider that particularly you know for for campus universities where um, part of the student experience has been really affected by switching to online during the pandemic um, really trying to grapple how do we bring back that culture that community that that is so easy and, and important for students identity as they're transitioning to higher education um, so I think those are going to be the main drivers but I think there's sort of some some considerations that might follow on from a kind of commuting and emissions perspective that's brilliant. Thank you guys ever so much. I'm terribly sorry to say because I could happily talk about this for the rest of the day, but we are at the point now where we've reached the end. And uh, I just wanted to thank you very much, as well as all the rest of our uh, speakers, presenters, panellists um, joining us today. It's been really, really interesting for me. I hope our audience has found the same. Once again, for anyone who came late uh, or didn't get your answer, uh, question answered, there will be a recording and we will get your questions answered, I promise. Um, thanks all for coming on behalf of Mobility Ways. We will be doing another session later in the year uh, where we're going to touch on uh, similar topics, but also uh, we've got some exciting stuff in the pipeline as well. So stay tuned from us. Um, if you haven't uh, registered for our um, our ongoing emails please do please do register your interest at team at mobilityways.com all that remains to say is it's probably lunchtime for a lot of you enjoy your lunch thanks for joining us and uh have a great rest of the week and weekend goodbye for now